why is data kind of important in the Web2 world or even in traditional finance markets? And why do people pay so much money for access to kind of different types of data? That's that's the perfect question, Logan, because I think the generalized Oracle problem for blockchains misses an important nuance. Um, And that nuance is that most data on the Internet is free and generally accessible. Um, and then there is this subcategory of financial market data, which has a annual revenue of about six and a half billion dollars for streaming, another three and a half billion dollars for benchmarks. Thank you again, Mike. Uh, really appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Uh, glad we got to connect in Spain initially and uh, at the Avalanche talk conference talk all things uh, Pith and now doing it a little bit of a longer form conversation. So really looking forward to this one. Likewise, I'm looking forward to this too. Perfect. Well, uh, let's just start a little bit about yourself. Maybe give a brief intro. Uh, You're currently the director at Pith uh, for Jump. Could you maybe just get share a little bit about how you got involved in the industry? And then once you were at Jump, uh, how you got involved with Pith? Yeah, sure. Um, I started traditional finance um, in 2006 at Morgan Stanley uh, on the FX desk. So at this time, uh, the equity market was already fully electronic. The futures market was already electronic as well. Um, FX market was just sort of becoming electronic. um, And I kind of gravitated towards that side of the business. From Morgan Stanley, I went to KCG, which is a systematic high-frequency market-making firm that was eventually acquired by Virtu. Um, And so that allowed me to kind of cut my chops in um, in a more streamlined environment. Um, From there, I went to Jump. Um, in 2019 to join Jump Crypto. And a year later, we started working on um, the Pith network. And I've been leading the business side of, of Pith, and I've joined to become a director on the Pith Data Association um, since that time. Amazing. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Uh, appreciate the background and the additional context. I would love to just start out the podcast with why data is important and maybe even outside of the context of crypto, why is data kind of important in the web two world or even in traditional finance markets? And why do people pay so much money for access to kind of different types of data? That's, that's the perfect question, Logan, because I think the generalized Oracle problem for blockchains misses an important nuance. Um, And that nuance is that, most data on the internet is free and generally accessible. Um, And then there is this subcategory of financial market data, which has a annual revenue of about six and a half billion dollars for streaming, another three and a half billion dollars for benchmarks. Um, And so you can kind of understand that you need different solutions for those different types of of data. Um, You can also think about it as Google takes generalized data and makes it available to everyone, but it isn't the place that you go for financial data. There's still these specialized networks. People still use Bloomberg. There's, you know, there's a, um, a pretty high barrier to getting a Bloomberg subscription. What is Um, it now? $25,000 a month or a year? (laughs) I'm not sure. I don't have one, Um, (laughs) but uh, (laughs) just use Pith for it. Um, But, but it's, it's 20% of the revenue for large exchanges. And so there's about 30 to $35 billion a year um, at the exchanges. And so it's a very valuable piece of data. And if you were to think about the use cases that it opens up for the world of, of crypto, um, they're, they're huge because one of the killer apps that we know of is, is DeFi. So blockchains enable things that were never before possible within the world of, of, of finance on the internet or, you know, on blockchains. Um, and so it's such a critical component. Um, and that's why we focused on building a solution specifically for this. So um, to answer your question, why is it valuable and where does it derive its value from? And why is it 20% of the revenues of these large exchanges? It's really um, because that information is what all traders will need to be able to engage in and operate on an exchange. And so just dumbing it down to first principles. Financial market data is the price with which traders would like to trade with each other at, the bid and the ask, and the price that they have just traded at. 
um, more or less that sums it all up. Um, and the revenues are typically at the exchange level only because on centralized exchanges, things become very centralized. Um, they typically will sell that data in sort of three categories. So the first category is people that need access to trade from time to time. So it's kind of like your casual user. Um, and you can think about those as being your average Schwab or Robinhood trader. They probably have never heard of market data before, and they certainly don't have an itemized bill of where they pay for something, but in the back end, it's being enabled for them. And then if you go up one rung, there is kind of a more complete market data package. And this would be from non-high frequency trading firms, but professional trading firms. So could be a um, like a Tudor or Appaloosa, large hedge funds that require you know, market depth and other insights to be able to make execution decisions when they've, when they've developed a thesis. And the third category is the highest frequency and the highest fidelity data. Um, and that's the, where the large, like high frequency trading firms or systematic tr trading firms operate. And they will understand the nuance and idiosyncrasies with that data, but they will also use it to be able to train models, um, to develop alpha that can compete at scale. And that's really the, the business model for a large trading firm. It's to be able to determine an alpha and compete and deploy that alpha at as much scale as possible. Um, and so the data really, you know, drives everything um, and all of those trading decisions. Yeah, no, uh, definitely an in-depth answer. And I appreciate you going, uh, breaking apart kind of those individual segments as well. I think we are kind of very early in the entire blockchain landscape, especially DeFi specifically. And I think bringing in kind of the data component on chain uh, and what would traditionally in the Web2 world just be a little bit easier with APIs, adding in that decentralized element makes it a little bit more of a challenge. Can you share some of the challenges that you and the team have kind of experienced or either had to work through on trying to bring this real world data into blockchains? Yeah, absolutely. The, the initial kind of knee-jerk reaction when you're thinking about the Oracle problem is, well, the data is all on Web 2, you need to bring it onto Web 3, and therefore the solution for kind of generalized Oracles, not specialized ones like Pith, is, hey, all the internet has the data, we just need to incentivize nodes to scrape it off and publish it and come to cons some consensus on a blockchain. And, and that's effectively what every other model does, that's what Chainlink does, they have got nodes, um, that go out and they go to public API endpoints. Um, they, they create a consensus themselves or an average and they publish um, that average. Um, so that we know being in finance is not going to work for, for financial market data. And the analogy I always draw is to digital music in the late 90s. Um, so you, you basically had a time when we were transitioning from people buying CDs to you know, people consuming digitally. And there were smart people that would buy the CD and they made the conclusion, well, I own the CD. I therefore own the digital representation of it. Lo and behold, Napster grew to become a huge music distribution channel um, and then was eventually sued into submission by the IP owners and various lawsuits, Metallica and other large record labels um, that took part. Um, but they ruled that, look, the, the digital representation um, is, is true to the copyright. And so the way that you need to be able to consume something that's still under copyright, a valuable copyright as well, is you need to make sure that the creator is compensated for it. Um, it's you know your typical tragedy of the commons. If you just deliver this for free, people will stop making it. Um, and so the, the idea that you could take this data from like a Yahoo Finance um, and just pretend you didn't see that they have terms and conditions that don't allow you to make that available for public use, you know, is, is to us very naive. Like no one's going to let you walk away with six and a half billion dollars worth of value and say, ah, shit, it's the, uh, the blockchain got the better of us. It, it yep. won't work. It's, it's just not set up for scale. So we needed to figure out a way to get that data on chain. The large exchanges are still sort of apprehensive around crypto. 
They don't know if it's a, you know, a friend or a foe. They don't know if it's something that they can really participate in. If it's a different market, is it cannibalistic? Um, so asking them to provide that data on chain is probably not going to be the place you start. And that's not where we started. So as I said in, in the, you know, the first principles of market data is it's the prices where traders want to trade. It's a trades where they just happened. You can go upstream from the exchange to the traders and say, well, you've got valuable data. Why don't you publish that on, tra- on chain? So you've already started to decentralize this model for market data that's never been done before. And what's pretty unique about this is the large trading firms have never thought about this as value. It's, it's almost like saying, hey, we have this extra vacation house we never used. And, and lo and behold, Airbnb comes up and you're like, you know, you could rent that out. Oh, wow, I've never considered that. And you'd be willing to rent it out probably at a cheaper price than a hotel would because for you, it's just additional revenue. Of course, you have to get comfortable with the fact that people are going to be sleeping on your mattress. But um, you know, those sorts of teething pains then allow you to have this new supply. And so Pith created a new supply for financial market data that's able to be broadcast on chain. And we did so in a very rapid way that has grown to over 80 of the largest institutions, starting with big trading firms and some crypto exchanges then small equity exchanges, up to the point where we had SIBO join the network in December and they're the third largest U.S. equity exchange under their BATS Impressive. umbrella. Yeah. And, you know, if I, if I can um, borrow the analogy, it's like getting the Beatles collection on Spotify. It's not that we're, we're eating their lunch. They understand that this is a different market. We want to be players like we're players in the traditional market data business that, you know, this, this large revenue generating business today. We want to be big players in the DeFi one. And we think that even if we're just the 20%, let's assume that there's other exchanges, we can't win that at a very minimum, we'll be able to, um, to participate on that. And so that was really the, the way to decentralize it is find new sources and then combine them together in a way where you can generate a feed that's of the highest quality and then be able to broadcast that for some period of time for free, right? So all the pith prices right now are on um, or started off on Solana fully free. People take it off chain. Now it's delayed a little bit relative to what you would buy if you had a co-located stream or even one of those three categories. Um, in traditional finance because it's dealing with blockchain speeds. But it's still one of the best sources you can get of real-time data for 250 symbols that cover equity, FX, crypto, and uh, metals. Yeah, maybe on that specific topic, blockchains kind of are inherently slightly slower because of the decentralization aspect. How... Do you feel like, especially being at Jump and uh, being at a trading firm, how do you feel like institutional clients, traders, um, people kind of outside of the blockchain world view this technology? And over time, do you feel like what you're creating at Pith, at Jump, um, with the different technology solutions that you're building, that more and more of kind of these traditional trading will move on chain? Or do you think eventually they'll kind of just or continue to be kind of different ecosystems that progress simultaneously? Yeah, there's a lot to that question. So the first part was, you know, how do we think that kind of the average person views this relative to sort of the centralized exchange? And I think that, you know, we'd probably both agree that we're in the the infancy of the growth of, of, of real crypto use. You know, you've yeah. got the token holders and then you've got the, um, you know, the, the, the tinkerers and then you've kind of got the hardcore core, um, developers and each circle has about a, a bit of a power law distribution on them. And it, it, it goes down to, you know, hundreds of thousands probably at the core. Um, so right now we're, we're dealing with proof of, proofs of concept. Um, so your average person probably sees this and, thinks that it's an interesting idea. Um, For trading firms, we think about it as enabling features that are inhibited by the current set of trading norms. Um, So, you know, the reason why lots of people get into crypto is because, you know, there's this friction-free way to pay people around the world. Um, That applies to investing as well. The average person in China 
wanting to get exposure to Tesla stock is going to have a tricky time. And, you know, if you can stitch together the markets, the global financial markets a little better, that probably benefits everyone. It benefits Tesla. It would benefit that person from getting exposure if they're limited, um, especially if they're in a, in, a, in, a, in a regime where they don't have a lot of opportunity to invest in companies that can potentially grow. And so we believe that that's sort of the next evolution. Um, and those are some of the big unlocks. Um, so the, the, the ways that you get to like those features will always be gradual, of course. And the reason why the, the market data price is so important to get right is because as soon as you have exchanges with different pools of interest, the only way to tie them together it, well, there's two ways to tie them together, but the easiest way to tie them together is to have market data that can incentivize people to keep them in line. So that's the way that they tend to have perps exchanges where um, you'll have a reference price. And if the perpetual is getting out of line to the benchmark, then you'll create incentives for people to go either long or short. So that's sort of this basis feed. The other way to do it is if, if you just have enough traders who have enough of an opportunity to arbitrage those prices back in line, it will happen as well. Um, I think growing small, small exchanges or small pools of interest with all the traders is not the way that you're going to get this done quickly. That would take a really long time to build this pool of liquidity and then start to stitch them together. So you can sort of jumpstart it by having the really high fidelity market data with a really crappy exchange. And then it can actually serve you a very specific type of interest so long as they're, they're integrated correctly and it's being tied back to reality. Um, so I think that's, that's where we'll get to. And I don't, I don't really have a, a view on whether or not like one is going to end up being, you know, the, 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 the winner, um, or the future monopoly. But I think that for a while, at least they're very different use cases. Um, and like the Americans have people who live in America and can invest in America, they've got it pretty good. Like you can invest for next to nothing. It's the rest of the world that has a more difficult time, but they can't invest in those American stocks. And, um, you know, you, you, you need to get to a point from both a technological as well as a regulatory perspective where this can be enabled. Yeah. And I think you make a great point, kind of the rails that the blockchains provide ultimately allow this global connectivity that was very hard or almost impossible to do without it giving people outside of the U.S. Uh, kind of access to the things that we've kind of come accustomed to. On that point, though, you mentioned uh, in the blockchain world kind of liquidity. And I think Ethereum kind of being the first smart ch contract platform uh, to really add the ability to do smart contracts was the first to kind of play around with DeFi. They hold much of the liquidity today. Some of the other ecosystems that are newer, I think that Pith also supports, uh, even including Solana, don't have much liquidity. Do you feel like when you're talking with like, again, like the trading firms or on the institutional side, there's a focus on one particular ecosystem or another, or is it more broad, just kind of like wait and see uh, what happens and what gets built? Yeah, it's, it's tough to say because I think that the large trading firms like to see where there are clear advantages. And so there was a clear advantage on Solana when it debuted because it allowed throughput and you know, speeds that we didn't think were really possible in the short term on blockchains. Um, and so I think that attracted a lot of attention. Pith first started by being built on Solana. Um, it's now built on something called PithNet. Um, but the, the responses that we got from the data provider community was, yes, this makes sense. We want to be on the fastest blockchain. And I don't think you can find an application that has more provably um, attracted so many institutions to engage in a blockchain. That blockchain is Solana. Um, so they all now have um, have experience of publishing directly on chain, which gets aggregated by Pith. And, and that's really nice. Um, in terms of the, like the, the, the use cases and the TVL, obviously EVM has been the, the large winner. Um, I've heard a lot of people make reference to EVM and Solidity being sort of the JavaScript 
um, of, of blockchains. It's, it's totally possible. Um, it's, it seems likely though, that we're, we're early enough where something could change that, but, um, but I don't, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's also very possible that it just sticks and, um, and we end up with, uh, with a huge percentage that, that just really likes that environment. Uh, Sui and Optos are cool because they do similar things to Solana with a slightly different twist. Um, the move language has got really nice expressiveness to it um, while making sure that it's lightweight so that you don't have to uh, worry about latency being added in. Um, so we're, you know, it's too soon to tell uh, which institutions are going to, to migrate to. There'll probably be use cases. I'm sure lots of people have similar views that there'll be chains that will be good for certain things and there'll be other chains that'll be good for, for other things. And then there'll be the, the weird stuff that you never expected, like Solana is the DeFi chain, but yet you have all these NFTs that are there. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there's going to be a lot of unexpected. Uh, the, 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 the institutional community, even though they put a lot of liquidity in place, they tend to be thinking about it more from an opportunity perspective, unless they think that there, there's a need to bootstrap an ecosystem. And so Pith is largely been bootstrapped by having so many data providers that stream data onto, onto Solana initially for, you know, it's about a hundred symbols, including equity that were almost never being used. And that was a largely a proof, proof of concept. We wanted to be able to show the world that every second you can get a couple updates for Apple for free everywhere. Anyone can use it, compile on it, compose on it. Um, and, and that was really exciting. What was being used was crypto data and is crypto data. And by the way, that's the reason why like these Napster style, I call them Napster style oracles, have not been student of submission because most of the, the usage on chain is for crypto market data. And the, ex the large crypto exchanges have only just started to charge for market data. So Coinbase, I think in December, just announced that they'd be charging for market data. Binance doesn't charge anything. The traditional exchanges didn't charge for market data until about 15 years ago. And then it became a large portion of their revenue. And they've sort of segmented and itemized it where it actually feels productized as opposed to just like, we're going to extract more money because we think we can. Um, that will inevitably happen on crypto data as well. Um, and if the demand for real world assets starts to go up, that's what Pith is uniquely positioned to be able to do. It would be really difficult for a chain link to be able to get a lot of U.S. equity prices on chain um, in a way that doesn't violate the terms and conditions of some third party publisher um, to make it fully permissionless. And, um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's certain like bootstrappy type elements that traders will go and make liquidity available. And then there's the opportunistic set. Now, most traders tend to be opportunistic and they say, all right, there's a lot going on here. I'm going to go and buy a bunch of ETH so that I can post it up and I can be a trader. Um, and, um, I think that's, that's more, more common versus like the, the ones that tend to be early in, in liquidity are much more like VC um, like slash VC firms where they're like, you know, we really need to be here. We're probably going to get punched in the gut a bunch of times. We've got to stand there and take it because it's for the greater good. It's so that other people can get, um, get interested and they can see what we see. Um, and we don't have to wait for this to be built piecemeal over a really long time. We can hopefully kind of jumpstart things. And just for clarification, the kind of comparison with Chainlink and bringing that data on chain is primarily centered around instead of just tapping into third party providers, actually partnering directly with the source and having them give you that data to put on chain uh, directly. They put it on themselves. So every one of the data providers is running a Pith node and they're publishing the data directly onto the PithNet blockchain. Um, and, and that's different than having. DevOps teams running a specific software that goes and points to Web2 APIs and compiles them together. Um, again, this is a very specific Oracle network for high frequency financial market data. The Chainlink model works great when you're doing this in a much more expressive way and you want to go get free weather data, for instance. Um, but, but we think that for the use case of, of financial data, you really need a specialized solution. 
Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. Could you speak? I mean, one thing that you said was powering all this was PithNet. Could you speak a little bit more to that, uh, what PithNet is and how ultimately it kind of works on a high level from a technology solution? So Pith launched on Solana September 2021. And within six months, we had, I guess, about 90% of the total value secured on Solana um, and really haven't left that position. So we've been very, very lucky to, to, to be early and to have a, you know, the right product for, for that market. Um, however, Solana became very popular in stuff other than DeFi, as I mentioned, and we were experiencing outages from time to time. Now, Pith was always designed to be cross-chain, and whenever we were getting close to deploying our cross-chain strategy, which was empowered by Wormhole, um, we would get the question, well, what happens if Solana goes down? And we realized that we needed to have a backup. And so we worked closely with the Solana team to develop PithNet. So it's run on Solana technology, but it doesn't compete for runtime. So it's just this, it's just the Pith application. And so we will have each one of these data providers. There's, I think, 85 now um, who run the validator nodes or have a third party that will run the node um, for validation. And they publish directly to PithNet. You've got the same characteristics as Solana, so you can audit everything. You can use a Solana Block Explorer to do so to ensure the um, the uh, the fidelity of the aggregation, which is all done on chain. Every update is published to PithNet fully transparently, fully publicly. And then any one of those updates can be delivered to a target chain that Pith is connected to. Today, there's 21 chains that we're connected to. Um, and the way that we've set this up, rather than pushing all the messages to every one of those chains, everything gets published on PithNet, and you just take the one message that you need in a particular transaction. So we call this the pull model. And from a gas perspective, it's wildly more and more more efficient. Um, and we realize this in running, you know, PithNet or running on Solana. We needed to think about gas. So we've scaled down some of the symbols that were not being used on Solana, but we're still 50% of the block space today, or Pith is. So it's about 10 million transactions a day um, currently on, on Solana. But then everything on PithNet's much more. Um, and, um, and, and we deliver you know, in this sort of scalable way. Very interesting. No, I, I saw uh, in Nason, uh, it kind of breaks down um, Solana's blocks and Pith by far is kind of the number one user of uh, block space uh, just being able to post the different oracle updates on all those different tickers it's it's very interesting yeah yeah it's a it's a chatty app yeah for sure and so you were in that pull model specifically on pipnet you have say i don't know do you have any like numbers of like is it 5x 10x the data that you're putting on like solana directly Oh, we've got about, um, we've got about, let's say, um, two and a half times the number of symbols. And so you can kind of assume that that's about the, 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 the multiplier because we've got around the same number of publishers on average, I think, across the, the selection of two, um, two ecosystems. So yeah, it's a far, fa fair bit more. Interesting. And on Pit Network, you said it was similar to Solana. Is it, I guess, on a high level from a technical perspective, uh, running its own validators, et cetera? Well, the, so the, the data providers are the validators. So each one of these 85 data providers will also run a validator. I see. Interesting. Very cool. Um, yeah. And then maybe speak a little bit more to kind of the Oracle system and like onboarding these different partners, how do you go about thinking about adding new people to the Oracle system? Uh, is the goal just to add as many as possible to create the most robust data set or are, are you kind of selective and who ultimately gets uh, to able to post data on chain? The goal, the goal eventually will be to be fully permissionless um, and let people provably demonstrate that they've got great data and that they deserve to be in the network. Um, before we get there, we realized we needed to bake in some trust assumptions that 
would make Pith more reliable for people or, or at least get over the hurdle of, hey, is this like network going to be something I can trust? Um, and so the way we did it was, you know, make it kind of this proof of authority where each one of the nodes has to, or each one of the nodes, which is a publisher of their own, of their own data, has to have a business bigger than publishing onto Pith that they're, if they were to screw up publishing on Pith, they would take a big hit on. So like Jane Street can't go out and screw up Pith Publishing just to make a little bit of money. They would ruin their reputation. Their VC business would be destroyed. They probably would get kicked out of trading on centralized exchanges. Um, those were the types of, of things that we went through in onboarding that first batch. Like how do we make this the highest reputation? And we've been really successful in attracting these big names. We've, we have almost every large trading firm without exception as a, as a data publisher on Pith. Um, and then the, the, the exchanges obviously is, is sort of the, the next group and criteria. Um, and we want to continue to add until we can have a position where you can be anonymous, fully anonymous, and we feel like you can't game Pith. Um, and so there'll need to be the things that you've done on, on that other blockchains have done to combat this, which is, you know, put up a stake. Um, making sure that it, making it uneconomical to do some kind of a civil attack with like replaying the pith price back to it and then heavily discounting any delayed feed versus the update such that if someone does do this kind of free rider strategy, they don't end up earning any rewards when, when they're fully distributed on chain. We're, we're not quite there yet, but that's in, that's in the, uh, the, the roadmap to, to have on soon. Um, but it's most certainly the goal is to to remove the necessity of having each person have to announce themselves, you know, put it on the the Pith website, um, and be a name where it's like, great, it's you know, this is this makes tons of sense. Yeah, no, it 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 uh it makes complete sense from my end, and I think that decentralization process is hard. I think most of these projects kind of start out somewhat kind of. A little bit more top down and as they find uh, product market fit as you kind of get a better understanding of how your product is used on kind of both sides uh, that decentralization process kind of naturally or kind of gravitates towards uh, decentralization over time yeah totally agree um, we, we've been lucky in in having it be decentralized from the start and um, and and making sure that like the, the the network didn't have single dependencies. It was truly, I trust Pith because of the strength of all of the data providers. You know, I'm not heavily reliant on one versus another. Um, and, you know, that ethos in building, it's not easy to do. And so you can imagine those first conversations were like a huge leap of faith. Um, and then it's become much easier. And in fact, it's almost become a, um, you know, a kind of a cool members club for trading firms to say that they've made it. You know, like we're, we were accepted as a, as a Pith publisher um, because we've got good enough data. Because you do need to have really good data to be able to be um, a, a publisher as well. Maybe jumping back to PithNet, is there any limitations, I guess, that you experience on Solana or even while expanding to these other blockchains that you found that were kind of like not inadequate, but ultimately slowed or you were not able to correctly build the product that you ultimately want, such as like some blockchains have slower block times. Uh, maybe you can't post as much data on chain because of the slower block times or the block isn't as big. You have lower throughput. Were there any things that make it a little bit harder just from a Oracle standpoint to kind of keep in line with asset prices as they change in real time? We were very dependent upon a fast block time um, and I think still remain so. Um, because our assumption is that, you know, trades happen on, on kind of finite blocks. And if you're not the fastest, then you're likely to be arbitraged away by somebody who, who, who's got an, um, an asymmetric view of the market. Um, and so, so that's what we, that's what we designed for the, I wouldn't say that there have been specific limitations based on Solana that we like regret any of the decisions. It's, it's just more around, we wanted to continue to grow to th thousands of symbols and hundreds of data providers. And Solana just became more popular and priority fees were a requirement to be able to make sure that there's, you know, not these huge 
um, like NFT drops that congest the chain. Um, so that, that was really the, the, the drive for it. Um, we, we found that in periods of high volatility, Pith on Solana would have less reliability than Pithnet. Pithnet, you know, we never miss a block. Um, and so sometimes we would have updates where we didn't have that. We didn't meet the minimum number, number of publishers. And so the price would be, um, not available for, um, for usage. It would be, you know, kind of in a, in a, in a, in a pending state. Interesting. No, it's, it's, it is all fascinating how all these kind of components come together. The small, I would say details or technical nuance of these blockchain architectures are very important, especially on the trading aspect where the arbitrage or as you said, like the different point of view in the world, uh, can be highlighted, uh, very glaringly. So in some of these systems. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, now that Pith has gone cross chain, um, I would say that the biggest representation of our, our use on like an EVM chain would be synthetics. So they migrated, um, they, they incorporated Pith into their Perpetuals V2 market. Um, and they've incorporated it using our pull model, uh, which is really nice because each user, when they do a trade on synthetics as part of the, the payload of that transaction, the Pith price is brought from Pith, PithNet onto Optimism. And so it's kind of that experience I was describing before, where it's like your Robinhood user who has no idea that they're engaging with market data. And so Pith begins to hit into these categories where that was previously done, as you said, through APIs, but effectively through subscriptions, right? So Robinhood has a subscription that's an enterprise license. You can use it if you want to trade on the application, but they can't make it public for other people to build a Schwab or some other trading app on. Um, and I think that what will eventually emerge to for market data on chain is something that looks like these three categories that we see in off chain. So Pith is now in, in December, there was about where we launched PithNet um, just a few months earlier, but we started to see our first traction. Uh, we had about 25,000 calls per month or in the, in the month of December. And then in January, we had about 50. And then in March, we had 100. And then last month we did a half a million and this month we'll probably do about a million. So we are seeing that major adoption of transactions being processed in this way. And we've built into the pith like payload, um, a, a, a placeholder for fees. So it's one way on every chain for the moment. And at some point you can imagine that like a business model would be, Hey, you're paid to use it as opposed to charging a subscription and having to manage the, subscription access. You can do, you can convert subscriptions into transactions if done well. And then there's other things you can do with data where you have like very highly specialized data. So the opposite end of the spectrum where the kind of high frequency data is, there are special use cases where we're, we're sort of exploring and we'll, we'll have some um, more to talk about this in, in the coming months, but where you can partner closely with apps that heavily depend on this and you can create a unique environment that allows them to um, maximize a user's experience let's say and then there's sort of a middle section where it's like you might have specific data that doesn't really fit into this stream of generalized market data maybe it's more enriched um, an example of this is liquidity oracles you don't need to look at the liquidity depth all the time um, typically you'll use it to make a governance decision based on how much you're going to allow to be deposited onto a lending protocol, um, given the, the, the collateral that, or given the liquidity that exists. Um, but you can imagine that that would be the type of data where you'd be willing to pay a little bit more than you would for a sort of that general access. So you start to see an emerging business model that fits those characteristics of how it was productized in traditional finance. It is, it is fascinating kind of, uh, I think in some regards, at least initially, we thought we were going to kind of recreate some of those world in blockchains from completely scratch. But I, I think now it's kind of taking what we've learned uh, from the financial markets in Web2 uh, or TradFi and bringing them and all those learnings and kind of applying them to a decentralized network and decentralized blockchain, which is fascinating. Could you speak, uh, you mentioned, I think, Wormhole a couple times. Could you speak to uh, like the relationship with Wormhole kind of being under the umbrella company of Jump and how you're using Wormhole with uh, Pith, PithNav work? 
Yeah, so both both Pith and Wormhole are completely you know independent projects, um, but are projects where Jump is an active contributor. Um, there is others that like Solana, where Jump's a very active contributor, um, and, and a few others uh, as well. So you know we have sort of a um, we build on top of Wormhole relationship. And depend on wormhole. Wormholes connected to, I think, twenty-one chains, and so Pith uses Wormholes connectivity to dummy-proof the sending of Pith messages and to be able to add in the trust that is embedded in their their, their setup of guardians. Um, so we basically will publish a message. Um, all these synthetics users will, you know, request that message, and then along with it, through Wormhole, you get this VAA. You get a proof that attests that the, the message was correctly passed from PithNet to the, um, to the target chains. And so it's been a, it's been a really good relationship. Um, it's really empowered this growth that I've been um, mentioning and allowed Pith to grow from being a Solana Oracle in people's minds to probably went from a Solana to a synthetics Oracle. And now it's on, you know, we've, we've launched on Sui and Optus and, um, and, and are continuing to expand with an EVM. So I think people start to think about Pith as being kind of everywhere and it wouldn't be possible without Wormhole. 100%. And I, I think even on a larger picture, I think people underestimate how involved Jump is in building some of these core infrastructures that is going to power a lot of, say, the new crypto ecosystem to come. And uh, I'm always continuously impressed by the team and what you guys have built at Jump. Uh, I think you guys are pushing the ball forward on multiple regards, whether that's Wormhole and the bridging experience, uh, Pith, or even with Fire Dancer. Uh, you guys have your hands in a lot of different pies. Yeah, there's um, there, there's an ethos within like the jump, I think, company where people just look for really hard problems and try and fix them for almost the pleasure of fixing them. Um, but usually there needs to be like some sort of a, a, a payoff, either a couple years down the road or like at some distance away. Um, and, and that allows jump to invest in like microwave networks or um, or other things that are required to be able to make sure that you stay in the fittest condition two years from now running a you know strategy that needs to trade between New York and, and, and Chicago. And that ethos is, is really helpful in building blockchain products because you can understand where you need to build things for a really long life cycle that has the characteristics of being able to scale. And so the reason why Pith was was something that we liked is because it's it's not necessarily it wasn't necessarily a problem today, but it was a huge problem if you just take a couple steps forward. You're like, well, how the hell are you going to get six and a half million dollar billion dollars worth of market data on chain so that you can actually build this? And you know, there was no good answer, and we're like, well, this needs to be solved if you're going to build any of the DeFi stuff. And we at you know the people that are working on Pith, um, we we think that we can add in a kind of a mature financial background at competing at the highest levels to be able to create the infrastructure that's needed. So it's a very professional type of institution where we, you know, we have this kind of theory of excellence that we bring the best people in and, and we're really very focused on, on doing things in a very clean way. Um, we're usually not the, 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 the loudest from a marketing perspective, um, but we realize that, you know, the, the, the products themselves will represent us better than we can do by by just talking about it. I think that ethos of uh, letting the product speak louder than uh, the marketing side is rare in crypto and I'm much appreciated. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad you guys are taking that approach of building products and then talking about them. Maybe shifting slightly, and I'll say I'll paint this in a broad brushstroke, so speak to it however you'd like. The U.S. has kind of taken a semi bearish point of view on crypto or at least not providing clarity in your like general point of view do you feel like this will change the crypto markets will things go more overseas or any thoughts around it, um how the US is kind of approaching crypto i really don't know it's very frustrating um the lack of clarity it you know it seems like a very easy one to win the reason why the reason why Silicon Valley was so successful was because they were generally accepting of the 
incumbent companies to come and basically break down the infrastructure of, or sorry, these new ones, breaking down the, the infrastructure of the incumbents. Um, and, and it feels like the, the approach that the U.S. has been taking towards regulation has been way more protective to, um, to the status quo. And, and that doesn't feel very American. And it, it, so I'm, as an American, <laughs> um, I think that that's unlikely to stay the, 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 the way things are. It kind of has to change um, or the U.S. will lose its ability to attract this top talent and to attract people working on exciting projects. I think it's too early to say that it's it's dying. It's it's certainly the indications are not good. Like it's it's certainly a um, a troubling set of sound bites, but it hasn't yet been like a full like shutdown where people are taking it so serious to go to other jurisdictions. I think the earlier ones are like, well, if this plays out, I'll find myself in a jurisdiction where everyone's going to want to be. But there's no clear winner yet. It's like. Could it be Hong Kong? You know, was it Singapore for a while? Is it now? Is it is it Dubai? It, it's not clear. It's more like there's indications that those could end up being hubs. Um, I'm still sort of holding out that the U.S. kind of does something to get it right. Um, although, um, you know, we are we are a globalized team, and um, I'm I'm based in Portugal. Um, although I am <laughs> an American, as I said, um, and um, yeah, we just have to be adaptive to whatever happens. Yeah, it is rather frustrating that the uh, lack of clarity um, kind of can hold back the space. But I, I think similar to the internet, what I appreciate about it is that it is global by nature. And if the U S I guess becomes a little bit more heavy handed, uh, I don't think the innovation or crypto necessarily is going to shut down or stop by any means. Uh, ultimately people will kind of move and continue to build if that's unfortunate. But like you said, I think, the proactive nature of people and the regulators in the 90s and 2000s kind of being a little bit more open arms to the internet industry really allowed the U.S. to uh, be where it is today. So I hope they kind of backtrack a little bit. Yeah, same here. It, 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 I don't really know how to handicap it, why, why it's been so different. I assume it's because like the banks just have more money and, um, and, and there's like more money in politics sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, it just feels so obvious what the, <laughs> what the answer would be and they should allow this. And, you know, the, the crazy thing is you get these clips of Gensler talking about how, you know, everything is, you know, they're not securities and like, he seems to like fully get things. And then he's taken this stance, which just feels so politically charged. It's, it doesn't feel like this is what he really believes. So um, I don't know. It's tough to, it's really, it's a tough one to handicap, isn't it? It, it definitely is. Um, maybe shifting as we wrap up the podcast, uh, the jump team is also involved in the fire dancer client. Uh, the fire dancer client is a second client being built for Solana. And I believe once this is kind of goes live, either early next year or whenever it does, it will be the only other blockchain that has two different clients Hopefully that will help with uptime, uh, as you mentioned earlier. And I think we've all experienced Lana had its issues and hopefully has figured those out. But the second client that the jump team is building should add more robustness and also speed. Is there any alpha that you could uh, share with the listeners or even things that you're just kind of excited about uh, in terms of the project? Yeah, I don't have any particularly strong insights, sadly. Um, you know, as a as kind of a builder on, on Pith, um, we're excited about the advances that a team like the Fire Dancer team is going to be able to contribute. Um, the, the caliber of people that are, that, that are working on that project are the, sort of the best in the world. Kevin Bauer is, is, you know, he's presented a number of times and, you know, people's heads have exploded. Um, so we're very excited. You know, we've seen like the, 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 the early sort of test net stuff um, with, million plus transactions per second, that would just be an amazing leap forward for, for crypto and for um, what we're building on. So we're just excited as everyone else. Excellent. Well, uh, I, I guess we can kind of uh, leave it for there and see what uh, Kevin Bowers and the Fire Dancer team uh, pulls out of the hat. But no, the demos have been uh, impressive nonetheless. Uh, pretty in crazy numbers. And in, in terms of things just that you've learned 
being involved in the crypto market or even being involved in Jump uh, throughout the years. Are there any like clear takeaways that you have kind of experienced just being in the industry that you could possibly share for newcomers or people that are trying to catch up with the space? Um, it, you know, it has to be Amon's law. I think it, it's called, it's the, um, you know, people tend to overestimate, um, the effects of technology in the short term and underestimate them in the long term. Um, we've seen that happen already in crypto in a few cycles. Um, and it's easy to find yourself in either side of that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of, of, of being patient, um, and waiting for the right time for, kind of the, the mass adoption to come, um, not trying to force it. You're never going to be able to force it yourself. It, it, it needs to find its own um, moment and it needs to sort of migrate and get everyone involved. It, it, it can't be done, I don't think, artificially. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's having patience and, um, and building something for, for the long haul. And um, if, you're, if you're not building something and you're just like kind of experimenting, just do as much as you can and, and, and just know that you're going to be among the earliest to this technology. And that's, you know, that wealth of knowledge that you're going to gain is going to be um, so helpful for you. 100%. I always tell people to uh, at least try these things. I think it's a little bit nuanced and a little bit hard to do so. But uh, if you're able to move your crypto from off the exchange to a hot wallet and kind of interact with some of these networks, use synthetics, use Lana, and really try them out. I think you are able to see at least a glimmer of where the world will be headed. And uh, it's definitely exciting to say the least. In terms of kind of things that you're either looking forward to on the pith side for 2023, or even as an industry, uh, what things kind of excite you the most just looking towards the end of the year or what you're personally building on the pit side? We're, we're very focused on scaling right now. Um, and so we, we've got the, the, the correct momentum. Um, so we want to make sure that we get that right. Um, of those three categories, we've sort of, uh, the, of kind of monetization of what monetization will look like in the future. We've kind of nailed this first one on what transactions could um, could be the other two we'll need to roll out uh, later on this year. So those are those are big sort of projects for us. Um, in terms of the ecosystem, um, I would like to see you know new takes on stuff. There, there is you tend to get one innovation and then you get a lot of replication of that. Um, and it's it's cool to see how fast you now can iterate from taking the code and creating clones of it. So I just I'm I'm excited to see what someone can surprise us with. Um, one trend that has been emerging has been the exposure to U.S. Treasury yields on chain because the um, the yields for USDT on Aave are like sub two percent, um, and the Treasury yield is you know Treasury bill is like five percent. Um, so it's interesting to see all these business models emerge for them. We're working with some of them at Pith. Um, Maybe that's the way that we start to get large amounts of institutional um, engagement with blockchains. And that would be really exciting. Or getting pockets of other securities that have a leg into crypto ecosystems. Um, you know, I think those could be really exciting things and, and that could really kick things off. Yeah, no, I, I do agree I, that Spark, uh, whatever it may be, I think we're all looking forward to it. And I think now... At least we're getting to a point where the infrastructure, we've kind of explored the design space, in my opinion, on the infrastructure side with the different layer ones and different layer twos. And I feel like now there's a robustness that uh, hopefully will allow scale for the next kind of bull market per se, uh, because we kind of fell flat on our face on this time. But <laughs> at least we had applications uh, in 2017. There, there wasn't much. Uh, we were just kind of excited about things. Yeah, you get those little cycle curves and just gradually getting more and more. So, exactly. That's right. Is there anything in particular that you think, um, whether an ecosystem or maybe not particular project that you think is kind of harming the ecosystem or you think you would like to see like less of? Oh, um, I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, nothing nothing jumps to mind. I don't have like a strong view on like ordinals is I, I think the the most um, contentious debate these days, and I don't have a particularly strong view on it. So um, um, no, I don't I don't really have anything that. Um, I think needs to stop. <laughs> well, I, I try to add a little bit of spice at the end in all podcasts, but uh, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Do you have one this week? Uh, um, in terms of particular uh, things that I want to see like less of. Yeah. I... I do think in general the infighting within all these blockchains is rather large. I think... We're so early in terms of user adoptions. Some of the TVL like is larger, but people actually interacting on chain. I understand why there's lots of fights, and sometimes I jump into them as well. Uh, they're kind of entertaining and can um, spur lots of discussion. But more so, just I would love to see people that are actually creating that spark and trying different things, as you said, that are not like copy pasta. Um, it's harder said than done, but I, I think. I'm optimistic that the people that are around now are going to be the ones that catapult us forward to the next bull market, similar to the people that stuck around in 2018 and 2020 ultimately kind of kicked off DeFi summer. Cool. I like that. I'll take that answer too. Cool. Well, uh, <laughs> really appreciate the time, Mike. Uh, appreciate the in-depth uh, of your knowledge, sharing uh, more so about Pith and all the things that you and the Jump team are doing. Uh, it was a fabulous conversation. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Logan. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it.